All right, we have one of the semifinal games of the LRA coming up here in just a second. So super excited to be able to bring this to you guys. We can only grab one of the semifinals this weekend, as we are only going to have one match right now between Kamalari versus Haughty. And the finals are going to be coming up uh, this next week. So definitely tune in when we do go live for those streams. Uh, by the end of this, we'll know who is actually going to be in those finals. So stay tuned to, for the end of the video to find out who makes it to the finals of LRA Liga, Runa Terra de las Americas. But uh, first up, we got Kamalari versus Haughty. So it looks like we have a deep getting started here in Haughty's lineup. So running deep as well as mid-range frostbite and Leona Lux. Uh, I'm not sure if you have Camillari's lineup up or not. Or uh, looking for it. Ooh. Yeah. Why do I feel like I I believe it's a different name? Um, I'm just gonna throw that out there because I searched Camillari and it didn't pop up. So yeah, it's definitely a different name. Let's go ahead and pull up F. TX. Oh, is it? It's Amar, I think. Yeah, so this is actually Haughty versus uh, Al, sorry, Almar that we're watching right now. And just to uh, give everybody an idea of how this is going right now as far as the semifinals are concerned, we do have the normal, you know, we have two games we're going to go through here. There's actually two games being played as we speak, followed by two more games after this. Uh, so we'll get two games total for a total of two hours of gameplay here. There is a fifth game lined up in the event that these do uh, tie. You know, if, if both teams go one and one here because this is the semifinals and we do actually need a winner to figure out who's going to go ahead and advance. So we'll see who gets this first game here. So it's interesting to me that both of these players actually brought both deep and mid-range frostbite. This is not sort of the meta that we saw from either the, the previous sort of pre elise in pre-make-it-rain nerfs, or even just the duels of Runeterra 17 that took place the last weekend. You know, this is a, a little interesting. I'm curious to see why these players have brought it, but honestly, it feels like mid-range frostbite has been a staple across this Latin America league. It's just something that these players are really a big fan of. And, you know, we talk about how CDS Fall always feels like he has that deck in the lineup. You know, he is in this tournament. Maybe he has had influence on the region. Yeah, possibly. I, I think we always mention it when we see mid-range Frostbite. And um, I, I always just feel that it's such a consistent deck. You know, it might not necessarily have like a really good line or sorry, a really good matchup versus a particular deck, but it does okay versus most decks. And I think that that's why most people tend to go ahead and bring it to something like a tournament like this, because it will see a, a decent amount of consistency throughout the tournament. No feel the rush in these two players yet, but you know, talking about the game at hand, I know this is a fairly one-sided matchup. I think it generally ends up going the way of the mid-range frostbite, barring something like a ruination out of the deep player, which it doesn't look like is in Hottie's deck list. Let me just check and make sure on that. Yeah, it's actually weird. Feel the rush. I mean, we pretty much see it absolutely everywhere. So to finally not see it in a tournament uh, definitely surprises me a little bit. We do see Lee Sin. So it's not like, you know, a lot of the decks we've been seeing as of late, Lee Sin, Feel the Rush, it's not like they're completely absent. We do have the uh, the typical Zed Lee Sin build that we're used to seeing in these tournaments. And uh, in addition to the mid-range mid Frostbite, and then also deep on the side of Kamalari as well. That's interesting that both players decided and to take And we just deep. see come. That's weird. Yeah, both both brought deep, both brought mid-range Frostbite. I'm curious to see what the other players on the teams have brought as well. But So there is one Ruination in Haughty's deck that is sort of the out that he's going to be looking for. I mean, Reckoning just does so much work against this deep deck before they actually get to deep. And I mean, turn seven, not quite there yet. I think that this is one of the longest amounts of time we've actually seen a deep player need to go for this. And I mean, you know, the Slaughter Dock actually doesn't even play it. Yeah, wow. Um, I mean, the thing with Landmarks, right? They do have a certain amount of tempo loss when you do get them onto the field. So spending that three mana and not really having anything immediately happen uh, can definitely hurt you, especially when you're going up against something like mid-range Frostbite, where it's a tempo-oriented deck. We already see a super wide field on the part of Kamalari. 
So I can definitely understand not wanting to play the Slaughter Dogs. Looks like we are going to go ahead and play it after the fact. Um, maybe just didn't want Kamari. Oh, there's nothing else to play. Well, yeah, there's nothing else to play, but I think he just didn't want to give Kamari yeah. that, that safe feeling of, hey, you can throw whatever you want onto the field, and it's fine. Yeah, absolutely. But now he is deep the turn he gets it down, so he is going to immediately get that free sea monster. Can get Nautilus down on the following turn, but unfortunately doesn't have any follow-up sea monster to pair with it. Second atrocity is tossed. This first one is nowhere near lethal, and the atrocity lethals are always so scary to go for against this mid-range frostbite deck. One flash freeze, one harsh winds, and suddenly you're down so many cards, but the treasure trove top deck off of the shipwreck quarter created at round start sjw this could be what hottie needed to get back into this game wow yeah that is a really early treasure trove oh man um to get that so quick after we just popped it into the deck there is definitely going to help hottie out big time but as always good old rng oh. playing a factor here we'll see if we are actually able to get what we need with this treasure trove and this, this is so awkward for Hottie because his mana just lines up outside of the ranges of perfect curves. If he's going to play this treasure trove, nothing else in his hand can come down this turn. But, I mean, playing the Nautilus into this board, only being at five life, I think you're just setting yourself up for death by harsh winds. And, yeah, I like this a lot, Hottie. You're going to have to roll the dice. Let's see what's inside the treasure box. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's always, ex like, it's never boring when somebody plays a treasure trove, right? Uh, because even if the cards are seemingly not that great, they still are relatively impactful because five cards for zero cost is always usually okay. Okay, Ooh. never mind. I take it all back. As I say that, Ooh. we have some of the worst treasure trove cards I've ever seen pop out of that. Wow. So if I remember correctly, oh, no. Ugh. Okay, so I don't think deep actually counts as a keyword for the purposes of give it all, even though, you know, it feels like it very much should. My concern now is that because he had played the Shark Chariot, shifts, everything on your field will turn into a 10-8. Everything on your field will also gain Ephemeral. Yeah, I don't know if Haughty thought about that before we... Maybe he just is not going to play the give it all regardless. Uh, it kind of looks like that's what we're going for here, playing the Salvage first. We do have a Kill Breaker off the oh. top. Okay, so give it all into Killbreaker could just represent lethal here as everything is going to grow up to a 10-8. You know, you're going to wipe your opponent's board and then yeah. you have 40 damage represented. Even if they play a unit after the Killbreaker comes down, that's still 30 damage being represented. And you need to deal with that. And even if you do get something down after the fact and use a freeze effect, I don't think you're necessarily going to have lethal on the crack. Back. See, who said RNG was bad? Where else do you get... Four ten eight ephemerals going. Ooh, ooh okay, that's oh, bad. More like three eight ephemerals. Never mind. <laughs> ooh. So if if they don't gain deep, I am kind of curious. Like, are they all going to gain can't block and yeah. ephemeral as well? I'm a little confused as to what exactly give it all. Uh, sort of you know counts yeah. as a keyword, especially since this personally is the first time I've seen the card played. Okay. Wow. Okay, so it doesn't count ephemeral or can't block. Or last oh, breath it, uh, doesn't stop oh, reckoning. Okay, no, no, no. So, uh, give it all actually copies. It doesn't copy keywords. It copies buffs. So, I technically the can't block in the ephemeral isn't like an an added buff to the card. It's, it's a downside. Yeah. yeah. So, um, so it does kind of make but, sense why it's not copying it those. Is, right. Uh, no, no, no. So it's I think because the card inherently comes with deep, it's not going to get included with give it all. So I don't. That's I, kind it of looks like you're pulling up the card right now. So I don't know if you want to check the card text, but. Uh, pretty positive yeah. it's only added buff. So, like, if Tarek, as an example, I know that was a big question. If Tarek were to attack and buff the unit that it's, that he's supporting, um, and then you played Give It All, then because that was a buff given that turn, Give It All would actually uh, get those to stay for the remainder of the game. So, um, definitely makes sense. So, the, the so uh, or go ahead. Give It All says grant all allied keywords. Oh, it does say keywords. So, now yeah. I'm confused. If, if it says grant all allied keywords... Grant all allies allied keywords. Technically can't block an ephemeral or keywords. And we didn't see And so is deep. And so is deep, yeah. So never mind. I mean, I was... I'm pretty sure the way I just explained it is how it works, but with the wording on that card, the way that you just said it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's weird. So uh, Anyway. Well, we'll dig into that. As always, we, we managed to find something every cast to harp on. <laughs> yep. Oh, and now we're in another sort of awkward spot. We can't get down Killbreaker. Oh, it's already post-combat, though, so we can get down this uh, 
I'm a little surprised we didn't play the Abyssal Eye while we still had the Nautilus on field, understanding that Culling Strike was something our opponent could have gone for. But I guess we wanted to go for the Kill Breaker instead. That is going to be a total board wipe. And now we can get down Nautilus into Abyssal Eye on the following turn. And with that atrocity, you have to assume that this one's going to be all but wrapped up. It's a little interesting. I mean, the Treasure Trove itself didn't seem to have a big swing on this game. And it felt like Calamari was in a... Or, Camillari, sorry, was in a really strong position throughout most of this, not even needing that ruination that he has finally found yeah. off the top. But I mean, sometimes this is just the way it goes. You know, Hottie was able to stay in this one. The boards of Camillari never really got off in SJW. It's, it, I have to think it's because we never found a really good Trifarian Assessor. Uh, is that just the only reason why mid range frost? But as long as you get a Trifarian Assessor, you're usually okay. Um, I mean, there are a lot of decks that feel like you need one yeah. specific. Oh, look, there they are. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I mean, like Misfortune or Scouts, rather, even nowadays feel like they're really all in on drawing that Misfortune. Of course, the Lee Sin decks. And yeah, I mean, it feels like Trifarian Assessor is sort of the champion of mid-range Frostbite. Yeah. If you don't find that, it completely changes the game that you're playing. Yeah, no, I, I do agree. Um, I think not getting the Trifarian Assessor a little bit earlier definitely hurt. But like I said before, Treasure Trove... So there's something to be said about just pure card advantage, right? And it, card advantage, just having more cards than your opponent has. And even though Treasure Trove, we saw for the most part, when we first saw those cards, we're like, wow, that was terrible. He whiffed. They still had an impact just because it was five cards that cost zero mana. Yeah, but they all got reckoning. The salvage though, the salvage, the salvage. was big. I'll give yeah, you that one. But like two. four of your four of those cards just got died <laughs> by a reckoning. <laughs> but see, but like it it did still get the frostbite effect and the reckoning out of your opponent. Yeah, so you're trading essentially, and you get the salvage. So you got four cards for one card essentially when everything's said and done. And that much of a card advantage swing nine times out of ten is gonna put you, if not win you the game, put you in a good spot to potentially win the game. But uh, now we're going into game two here. And on the side of Haughty, we have a Leona Lux deck, which I don't want to say it's very, it's super popular, but we have seen it here and there. And uh, I'm good to see Lux. It, it's good to see Lux because I feel like she's very underplayed right now. And I really don't think she's that bad of a champion. So I recently put Leona Lux Soul back on my tier list just because we've been seeing these pop up a little bit more lately. And it, it'll be any combination of Leona Lux and A Soul as we saw originally. Generally, not all three are being run together this time. We are going the Leona Lux route, but yeah, I agree with you. I think that Demacia actually has some really underrated tools in dealing with Feel the Rush, which honestly felt like the boogeyman of the format. It's really not being run as much as we sort of thought it was going to be. We haven't seen any so far in this tournament. Mm -hmm. I think there was only one at the European fight night. It wasn't super popular in DOR. Scouts almost feels like it has taken that spot, but we're not seeing that tonight either. These are just some sort of you know, off meta decks out of these players. And I definitely don't hate the adaptation. It looks like we are going to get, yeah, Brittle Steel. And I don't know, this doesn't seem worth anything that you want to do because if you do double Pale Cascade, you are going to lose out on one of those draws unless you Guiding Touch first. But I mean, the whole thing about cantrips is you have to play them. There's not a perfect time. And honestly, I don't necessarily hate the idea of Guiding Touch double Pale Cascade here. Yeah, it definitely feels like it's a pretty good option. Um, and you will, you know, the only reason we want to play the Guiding Touch, obviously, is to make sure that we get the draws off the Pale Cascade. Looks like we aren't going to go ahead and pull the trigger on that, though. Which, because we're not going that route, we blow four mana. So I got to agree with you. Yeah. I, I wouldn't have been mad at seeing those two Pale Cascades just for the sake of playing mana efficiently. Because now we're going to fall way far behind on Tempo. And similar to, like I mentioned earlier, falling behind on card advantage, Tempo especially early on in the game, is equally as important. And having a Hearth Guard, a Trapper, and a Glory Seeker staring you down is not fun. Yeah, it's a lot of wasted mana. Your turn five doesn't look phenomenal into this Hearth Guard and Glory Seeker combo. Like, the Ravoon would have demanded a Pale Cascade anyway. I, I mean, you know, it's a consideration that Haughty made, and now we're going to see what card he goes for. Golden Sister feels like the only one that I wasn't considering taking. But that is the route that he has decided to go. I think the Meteor Shower would have lined up really nicely after your blocks were declared here. But, okay, now we're going to come one. into Pale Cascade to take out this Avarice and Trapper. At least we're using them. It's not like we're going to die with a bunch of cantrips in our hand. And now the Golden Sisters does set up pretty nicely going into turn six. But still just doesn't kill that Hearth Guard. Yeah, and, and does now play mana efficiently. So we are going to go ahead and keep this three spell mana going into turn six, like you said, to go ahead and play the Sisters. I mean, Ravoon is an option as well. Uh, it looks like we are going to go with the sister. So I do like that. You're getting the life steal down. You're also putting a little bit of pressure with the elusive, which uh, aside from frostbite and some sort of challenger unit, 
Kevlari is going to have a little bit of a hard time dealing with this elusive unit until we're able to get something like another Glory Seeker down. There it is. It's already down. So we will be able to deal with Ask that. Ask and ye shall receive, <laughs> SJW. Yeah. Ask and ye shall receive. I feel like that's how it works. The second I say something is going to happen or is not going to happen, the opposite always happens. <laughs> Nine times out of ten. So it looks like we are actually challenging the Lifesteal unit. So it looks like we're prioritizing getting that off the field, pushing 10 more damage. We're just going to force the block with the Elusive, which essentially does the same thing. And now we're going to get a Guiding Touch into a Pale Cascade, it looks like. Oh, and Radiant Guardian is actually a really nice pickup off wow. of that as well. That's going to be able to fight for the board pretty effectively, but... Are there any frostbite effects coming out of Camillari? Harsh winds would be devastating here. It would almost certainly force the hush out of Hottie wow. to at least be able to take out that glory seeker. Yeah, that feels really bad. Uh, <laughs> Harsh winds completely turns that combat on its head. Sure, you have the Radiant Guardian as kind of, uh, okay, here's a consolation prize for your for your efforts here. But yeah, this is going to be really hard for, for Hottie to come back from. He can't play any additional spells and get down the Radiant Guardian. Yeah. It looks like he has decided that getting down the Radiant is just a little bit more important than necessarily trading onto this Glory Seeker. But, I mean, that's just going to pull your Radiant Guardian to the side in the next combat. You're going to have to use your third Pale Cascade to actually survive that trade. And, honestly, things not looking phenomenal for Hadi. Let's see what pops out of the Ravoon. And not it's good. a Daybreak Dragon. That is not going not to good. be what you were looking for. So... One thing I want to point out, too, is, you know, this is a perfect example of a recent nerf coming in oh. big. Radiant Guardian now, if it attacks, does not trade with any of the 5-5s. Five now, the Captain Farron basically makes that a moot point anyways because it'll just block it. Yeah. But that's pretty big. You know, th this Radiant Guardian now cannot trade favorably with this Yeti, with the Hearth Guard. It's much, I don't want to say worse of a card because that makes it sound like it's bad, but it's definitely uh, less desirable than it used to once be. Yeah, it is certainly not the mighty beast that it once was. It is no longer sort of this angel of the battlefield, as the card art would have you think. It's more of a... Eh. <laughs> it's I. Eh. I got it. It's I. <laughs> no concerted strike picked up for Hottie does mean there's no clean answer coming out for that Captain Farron. And an Ice Veil Archer onto the lifestyle unit. Hottie tries he might, just not able to get through this life swing. Yeah, this is not looking good for Haughty. You know, I feel like this Leona Lux deck generally, especially mid or sorry, early to mid game, it's wanting to keep tempo over above the opponent. And unfortunately for <laughs> for Haughty, mid range frostbite, I think does that just a little bit better than the Leona Lux deck does. Uh is this is this Ash gonna level on the attack? We're at at least three. Is this just yeah, it's yeah, going to level on the attack. Lethal. Yeah, that should just be lethal. Yeah. I mean, we haven't even gotten into decimate territory yet. So, yeah, Camillari shouldn't have too much wow. trouble picking this one up. Yeah, this is, yeah, plus the three decimates in hand. This was uh, an insanely one-sided victory, I got to say. Um, I think this is actually one of the few times I've seen this matchup, too. Because, like I said, this whole Lux, Lux in general isn't very highly played. Lux Leona, when we do see it, uh, mid-range Frostbite isn't near played nearly as much as it used to be as well. So... Uh, interesting to see this matchup and mid-range frostbite just absolutely blowing it away looks like with the hush we might be alive though i don't think it matters we might but... be alive long enough to die to decimate yeah i was yeah like great now we get to live to see the next turn where we just died to decimate anyways so especially because like now we don't have hush for captain farron so we are still gonna take <laughs> a lot yeah we're actually just dead on this turn uh we're gonna need to guiding touch to survive that decimate but Ooh, yeah, this is, I mean, there, I don't think there's anything that Haughty can do to come back into this. And at, at the end of the day, it's kind of a cut and dry matchup. It's not necessarily like, oh, mid-range Frostbite is heavily favored against Leona Lux. It's it's Frostbite mid-range is heavily favored against decks that play three copies of single combat and concerted strike. Yeah, no, 100%. And uh, wow, just this field completely getting decimated by uh by Kamalari here and uh, <laughs> hey i had to throw it in there it's my first pun of the day i'm just getting warmed up all right yeah that's reasonable <laughs> and he can't, while he has the mana whore remembrance he has to save it for the guiding touch and he already has to pre-commit five mana to the next turn for the star shaping mm -hmm. and when you're not floating any spell mana that's way too big of a commitment you're not going to be able to play whatever celestial you do invoke is it's going to cost seven or more yeah. and there's nothing that haughty could do to come back into this it's just going to be a matter of time I mean, maybe the Radiant Guardian attack is enough, but I don't think so because you're you're still not killing this Captain Farron. 
and that is just representing an insane amount of damage on the following turn. Sure, you might get through the decimates here, but you are not winning this game on the side of Hottie. Yeah, and I don't... Uh, I mean, getting through the decimates itself is going to be a hard task. We have the star shaping to put us at 7. That alone doesn't put us outside. If we attack with the Radiant Guardian, okay, sure. Now we live again to see another turn. I mean, there's, I think, a little bit of wiggle room where Hottie could potentially come back into this, but... I can't I can't think of a way that Kamalari with those other four cards in hand doesn't have a way to just establish more of a field presence and just open attack next turn. Actually, even if there is no more units developed on the side of Kamalari, I'm pretty sure we just open attack anyways and we're good to go for, for lethal uh, because we are going to probably force out the star shaping this turn with the second decimate. There's the other Radiant Guardian for some more lifesteal, but even with an open attack, I'm, I'm pretty sure this is still just going to be lethal on the side of Kamalari. I'm trying to think. So you do get to block one of these units and then single combat into the Captain Farron. And even if that works out, I'm pretty sure... Oh, maybe you live at one, actually. Four, maybe you do six. live at one. Do you live at... Yeah, because this was... Well, this will put you back up to three. That would life steal for... Yeah. No, no, I think you actually live at two. But, you know, don't yeah. trust our math. <laughs> <laughs> We're not geniuses yeah. in that regard. But honestly... <laughs> At that point, you do kind of have to consider on the side of Camillari, you know, is there a single combat? Is there something like a concerted strike? You know, mm. is there really any punish for going for a developmental attack? Can't, do you really have to go for the open attack? And I mean, even if that play does work out for Hottie, he's once oh. again putting himself back down at zero. There it is. See, I knew it was going to. Yep. Oh, I was going to say, I knew it was going to be leaving you at one HP, but that's actually a two attack Omen Hawk. So that should wrap things up here on the side of Hottie. Technically, can Bastion this radiant guardian in order to gain just a little oh. bit more life but there the is the enchanted crystal arrow but i mean you bastion that you know the spell shield does negate the freeze effect you are now going to survive the omen hawk as well so now i'm trying to th so with the the math here we actually go up to eight we i think we live now we block yeah one you of live the, at we, one now, now we live at now we live at one <laughs> so. yes yeah, so no i I knew we were always going to win one <laughs> you were just Don't thinking five time. turns ahead yeah okay yeah my math is a little bit too advanced and Ooh, we feel like we have to throw down this as a blocker. I mean, it makes sense, but that hearth wow. guard really puts us back to square one here. Wow. Um, okay. Well. <laughs> oh, and a flash for yeah. That, okay, that's Jesus. It. That's the ball all game. Right. Everybody, go home. Chill out, Kamalari. All right, we get it. You want to win the game, all right? Just unfortunately for Hadi, Kamalari just has all the answers for this radiant guardian and frostbite after frostbite after frostbite. This puppy is not getting any life steal with that single combat off. And uh, Kamalari going to go ahead and take game two there. Going to tie the series up 1 1 for Team FTX here. So we'll see. Game three. Who's going to take it? Kraken or FTX? And again, you know, after all these four games are done, if there is a tie and both teams have picked up two wins, there will be a tiebreaker game as a fifth match, which we don't usually have uh, for the LRA on a weekly basis. So. Uh, we'll see as we get a little bit further into the day today. But it looks like we have Leona Lux again now going up against Deep. And I'm still so surprised that we see so much Deep all of a sudden. I, uh, I'm i not crazy about Deep. I don't think it's a bad deck right now per se. But it doesn't seem like it has a great matchup versus anything in particular. I would imagine it's going to... I think it's actually pretty good against Fielder Rush. Because, yeah, you know, you get two 10-10 champions. And then I throw out a 13-13 blocker. Uh, good point. <laughs> so now all of a sudden your 10 uh, 10s don't feel not only that, as big. but a 13 13 blocker that gives me a four mana spell to shuffle one of those units back into your deck, which is the cleanest way to deal with a 10 10 yeah. Trindomir. Yeah. So I, I think that might be a counter pick into a matchup like that. It's not something that I've tested extensively, but like the theory is there. Now, in a matchup like this, Leona decks are very very tempo oriented mm -hmm. you know you don't really beat anything in the late game you are a lux deck but you are not a lux deck that is capable of generating multiple lasers like a karma lux or a thresh lux that's you know reviving multiples with rekindler or pulling them out of the deck with thresh you're only getting one laser you're you are probably about as honest as a deck can get and i do not think a deck like that pairs super well into deep and we have Pretty good start from Kamalari, though. Uh, speaking of deep, we're already pretty well on our way to going deep here. Getting an early Celestial, though, from the Priestess here. Looks like we did decide to go with Comet, which makes sense, generally, when you're going up against something like a deep deck. You know, if, if they are going deep quick, you're looking like probably a turn 7 Nautilus, or at least some sort of big, beefy unit. 
uh, come turn seven, turn six, maybe even. So uh, Comet, definitely a good pickup. We'll see what Haughty decides to do here on the follow-up. Or if, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I feel like you just end it here and you bring it back over to you. You try to put some aggression on next turn. It's kind of awkward on the side of Audi though. Uh, Haughty, wow, Audi. I just forgot the H there for a second. <laughs> um, it's pretty awkward with this particular matchup, I would imagine though, because generally speaking, you want to try to beat aggro, or sorry, beat deep with aggro before they're able to go deep. And unfortunately for Haughty, I don't really think there's enough aggression in this deck to do that. So now we have to look a little bit more towards the late game. And I'm curious to see how this Leona Lux deck handles something like these big old deep monsters coming down a little bit later. Uh, I'll tell you, it doesn't handle it super well. Concerted Strike does get a lot of work done if you can maintain a board. Uh, there are a couple of question marks in a matchup like this. For example, Ruination can be an absolute blowout, but there are no Ruinations in Camillari's version of this deck an adaptation that we did see out of Haughty, so that's going to yeah. play against him a little bit. You know, does still have Vengeance. There's only one Atrocity, but with Grasp of the Undying and Withering Whales in here, you know, it is feeling a little bit more focused on beating the aggros. And SJW, I don't know if you saw this. I know that sometimes we'll see a card not necessarily look at the number. There's only one Jettison in Camillari's deck. And Maokai yeah. is a very potent win condition against something like this that is not really feeling like it's on the table when you've only got one copy of Jettison. And no copies of salvage yeah that does strike me as really odd um i mean i will say kamalari like i said did get off to a quick start as far as getting the dread dredgers we have the thorny toad down so we can kind of take our time getting deep it's not really a big deal but yeah I, I don't think it's often i see one copy of jettison to be honest with you um so curious to see how that works out i imagine we're not gonna actually have a turn seven deep with that being said even with the quick start Generally, that would lead me to believe that we're going to go deep on turn six or seven, but one jettison, probably not. And like you mentioned, Maokai, definitely an option versus, you know, this Leona Lux deck, but might not come online until a much later point in the game here. There is atrocity, uh, you know, atrocity could be a win condition here, uh, but there is a lot of heal. Obviously, we have the star shaping, etc. on the side of Haughty. And like you said, no ruination, but two vengeance. So, hmm. Very, very interesting choices on the sides of both players. The other problem is that Haughty invoked an extremely early Comet. And I remember when Lee Sin started to get really popular and I tried all these different decks against it and it was still running that heavy invoke package. Anytime I was like, okay, I found it, I would just get Cometed. And <laughs> I was like, okay, that's that's the end of the ballgame. Like, whether I'm playing Swain Leviathan or Deep mm -hmm. or something like that, like, there are decks that run hyper late game threats in Legends of Runeterra that just have absolutely no protection for them. And Comet snipes those weak I mean, those weaknesses so cleanly out of the format. Yeah. Uh, your first Nautilus is dead, and there is nothing that you could do about mm -hmm. it. You're not losing a lot of tempo work, but we're gonna wow. Comet the landmark. Um. <laughs> okay. I laugh not because of like you know that being okay. Well, that that's a punish. Okay. That's just a straight that's up not punish. What you to no, see. that's not good. I, I laugh because I actually forgot for a second that Obliterate got changed because of landmarks being released. That you can actually obliterate a landmark i feel like subconsciously that's the only reason you play obliterate on the landmark because just like i want to do this just to see it happen um that's a super i made a bet wow. with my friend that i could obliterate yeah. a landmark this event so <laughs> yeah, like... you may win this game but i'm up 15 bucks <laughs> so who really won um but that immediate and you saw the snap decision on the side of kamalari you're like oh you played your your comet all right i played my nautilus yeah, because he knows that that second Celestial that was invoked, no matter what it is, it does cost seven or more. So even if it is something like Supernova, Haughty still has to generate another Celestial before that card is playable. Yeah. And the chances of being able to invoke a Celestial and play Supernova in the same turn are pretty low. It would have to be exactly Solari Priestess. Yeah, and, and now we're at a really dangerously low life total here on the side of Haughty. I mean, as usual, like we saw in the last game, we're going to have Radiant Guardians. We're going to have a lot of heal. You see the the um, Guiding Touch as well as the Star Shaping in hand. We even have the Concerted this, Strike, which it looks like we this are. This yep. could just be lethal with the Atrocity in response yep. now that Haughty has tapped down below that mana threshold, nope. but not quite going to be the case. And everything is going to survive. But now with that Concerted Strike on, you have absolutely no chance of killing this Nautilus. No, no way. That's, that's the only removal, right? That's the only way that this deck actually deals with Nautilus outside of 
comet like we just saw already i used. mean you do have another solari priestess maybe the idea is to just invoke another comet but i think mm. he's a little more likely to go in something like this immortal fire here do you really just leave it up to chance though like eh, i hope i get another comet from the solari it priestess. is like... a 50 percent chance of invoking it that's probably not exactly how the math works out but i mean you only have six choices you get to see three of them i'll call I that 50 percent. Uh, i think it's i'm pretty sure that's 50 percent I'm kind of doubting it as well, just the way the cards show up. But yeah, I, I don't know. I just don't think, I just don't think you leave it up to chance like that. Like I, I'm still questioning that obliterate on the landmark. I mean, sure you. I'm not questioning it. I know exactly how I feel about I... it. <laughs> Why wow, you're that sure, huh? Maybe there's like some yeah, ten-headed sure. play on the side of Hottie, I... right? It could have been. What I will tell you is that I definitely would not have done it. <laughs> Hottie had a plan. It's not looking like it's going to work out yeah, for him. I'm sure out. that, you know, if the Nautilus didn't immediately come down from Camillari and maybe it was a bait. I didn't, I don't quite exactly remember how the turn played out. I don't remember if Camillari did have a priority sequence where Hottie was like, okay, you know, you passed it back over. Obviously you don't have a Nautilus. This is the immediate threat. I need to tempo you out. And as I had mentioned, I don't think that tempo matchups like the Leona Lux are very favored against deep. And I mean, I see the two arrows kind of glowing. How close is this Maokai? Does it even matter yeah, I, I, I don't think Maokai. So we were talking about Maokai earlier on. Maokai is not how this deck is winning right now. This deck is just going to beat down Haughty. And honestly, yeah. even if this Nautilus gets... Like, this Nautilus can get blocked like five times in a row and it's probably still not going to die. <laughs> um, yeah. So I don't really... I don't see Haughty being able to come back in this. And it's a similar situation as last game, right? Where, okay, maybe we heal up maybe we even have a, a leveled up leona now so like maybe we stun out kamalari for a few turns we kind of delay the inevitable here for a little bit but mm. oh that's not good either wow yeah this is just not looking good for haughty now it, it's definitely going to be almost impossible i, I don't want to say impossible we've seen weirder things happen but it's almost impossible it looks like for haughty to actually come back in this right now and Man, I, I gotta tell you, I, I think we mentioned it with the, uh, it was another, it was a day and night with Leona and uh, Diana where I'm always like, what is the win condition of this deck? And I feel like it's like that with every single Leona deck. Now Lux in and of herself is kind of a win condition so that I can understand, but it just seems like the de these Leona decks do a whole lot of nothing once it comes towards the end of the game. There are a lot of decks that you can tempo out, but I feel like there are just as many decks that you can't do it to. It's you can't more. do it to any of the ramp decks in the format. You can't do it to deep. Yeah. Like, not having this late game win con, really just relying on the Celestials. It, it works out sometimes, and it feels good when it does, but this is not one of those times. We're even seeing Camillari perfectly willing to overwrite multiple units in order to try and go for lethal here. Picks up a concerted strike, but I don't know how much that is going to matter here, as there are just way too many attackers coming in for Haughty. And yeah, even, even throwing out the Maokai, saying, you know what, if you want to block that, be my guest. <laughs> Yeah, and I do believe I'm not seeing an answer for this Nautilus. It's going to be game. Yeah, there's there's no fearsome blocker. There's not enough heal in the world to prevent all this elusive and Nautilus. Big boy daddy Nautilus coming in hot. Unfortunately, looking like Kamalari. Unfortunately for Why Audi, did you call him gonna, that? I don't know, man. Big big daddy? <laughs> all right, I will hold on. I've called him big just, daddy not a few times, all right? I get that. It's just like big boy dad. You could just I, say Nautilus. I said I think like I added person. too many adjectives in there. I wanted to say like big boy Nautilus, and then I, I said daddy afterwards because I really wanted to say daddy, so I don't know, man. Sound like a clickbait ad, like big boy daddy <laughs> Nautilus. Huh? Boy with a B-O-I, too, right? <laughs> big boy. Camillari win game, big boy daddy <laughs> Nautilus. And now we're back in third grade. <laughs> 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 oh man but uh, but that is going to be camillari picking up that set his frostbite mid-range and deep doing just a little bit more than hotties was and i mean that was uh just the lee sin getting banned out instead of the frostbite mid-range so it looks like camillari just having a little bit of a stronger third deck all right and there you have it so camillari actually did take that one home there for ftx esports however after everything was said and done Kraken was able to take home the victory there over FTX. So with that said, who are they going to be playing? Well, Mafia Esports and OTK went head-to-head -head after this semifinals and the other semifinals match. And it looks like we are going to have Mafia Esports... 
taking on Kraken in the finals of the LRA. So we will be bringing that to you guys next week. Definitely remember to tune in for the stream. Obviously, the videos will be up here on YouTube as well. But man, am I excited to finally bring this season of the LRA to a close and see who is going to end up on top. So as always, everybody stay healthy, stay positive. I hope shit just works for you and peace out.